Good afternoon, Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Shamika Siriman. I'm the director of ANGTAD's Division on Trade and uh, Technology and Logistics. And it is my team that puts together the e-commerce week, but with, a, with the help of all ANGTAD. And this is a one ANGTAD event. So very warm welcome to the, this high-level uh, di dialogue on the development dimension of digital platforms. In fact, for the last two days, you have been having lively discussions in every room of, uh, down there about the fast emerging digital economy and its impacts on, uh, on developing countries. As UNCTAD research shows, the reliance on digital platforms is one of the main characteristics of the digital economy. And platforms are a new business model for all of us, and they bring new opportunities as well as risks. So today, we have an eminent group of panelists and also trade and ICT ministers with us who are grappling with these realities on the ground to talk about how to fully benefit from the emerging digital economy and digital platforms while minimizing the risks they pose. So let me now invite our distinguished moderator, Ms. Catherine Fianken Bokonga, to begin the high-level dialogue. Catherine. Thank you. Thank you, Shamika, uh, for, for these remarks and for the introduction. So um, as uh, Shamika just uh, shared with us, uh, it is the perfect time uh, to speak about uh, e-commerce and also um, the, the platforms um, and um, the dimension of the digital platforms, how they can help to boost uh, e-commerce. And for that, we're very fortunate to have not only uh, these uh, panelists that I will introduce to you in a few minutes, but also we are very uh, fortunate to have different uh, high-level representatives, ministers of trade and commerce that are sitting in this room and that will have, of course, the opportunity also uh, to say a few words. Uh, we, we are going to try to be as interactive as possible, uh, so that's the reason why um, most of uh, the panelists will give us short uh, answers, because we would like to have a very um, dynamic exchange. So I will ask now to the, I, I will give you the team, uh, if you don't know the team of the day, um, for this high level dialogue, it's the development dimension of digital path platforms. And for that, I will ask the Secretary General of ANCTAT, Mr. Uh, Mukisa Kitui, uh, to give us some introductory remarks and um, to set the scene, please. The floor is yours. First, uh, I agree with indulgence. If we take a few more minutes, for the, for the we're, noise, we are trying to see if we can do something about that noise. Uh, meanwhile, you can introduce the members of the panel. Okay, I mean the noise is due to the heritage plan. So, the the, the United Nations are going to be beautiful uh, in a couple years. So that needs, uh, of course, some works and some noise. So um, we'll. Tr start to I will start to introduce you the different panelists so um, at I'll, I'll try to start with the very end um, we have the director general of WTO the World Trade Organization uh, mr. Uh, Roberto Azevedo um, that is uh, sitting at the end of uh, this uh, um, the panelists at this, the end of the the stage then uh, next uh, to him uh, is uh, sitting um, Mr. Uh, Dinesh uh, Argarwal uh, from India. He's founder and CEO of uh, IndiaMarkt.com, uh, which is the India's largest online marketplace. Uh, they have something like uh, more than 52 million buyers. Uh, so it is very important for India. So we just had the opportunity to hear the Secretary General of ANCTAD, Mr. Kitui. And next to Mr. Kitui is sitting uh, 
the woman of uh, this panel for the gender balance, uh, Mrs. Uh, Omobola Johnson, that uh, Dr. Johnson will be able to share with us uh, her experience as a senior partner uh, at TLCOM Capital. But um, uh, what is also very important is that uh, Dr. Johnson will be able uh, to share with us the, her experience as minister uh, for information and communication and technology of Nigeria, a very big um, English-speaking African country. Um, and um, she will be able to uh, share with us our experience in these uh, different domains. And next to me is sitting uh, Dr. Nick Snitschek. I'm sorry for the pronunciation, I will say Sernitschek, Sernitschek on Canadian pronunciation, as you just mentioned me. Dr. Sernicek is a lecturer in digital economy in the Department of Digital Humanities at King's College in London. So um, I think that now that the noise is over, um, I'll give the floor again to the Secretary General of ANCTAT, uh, Mr. Kitui. Thank you very much, uh, moderator. Excellencies, uh, distinguished members of the panel, ladies and gentlemen, may I, on behalf of UNCTAD, bid you welcome to this uh, high-level event. Honorable Ministers, uh, thank you very much for patronizing this occasion. As we sit in Geneva this week, we've been confronted by a challenge which has been magnified by recent international media. The underlying challenge is the growing importance of electronic market visibility for any businesses that need to penetrate new markets or even to have a foothold on existing markets where they're competing with the more connected enterprises. We are talking about addressing the conditions necessary for the developing and least developed countries particularly to access the new marketplace. As we see the exponential growth of that marketplace. And we see the concrete evidence of difference that while over 70% of most developed countries in Europe today, business is transacted online, electronic commerce account for 70% on average, the average for LDCs is below 2%. In Africa, only Morocco, Kenya, and South Africa are above 5%. And in many times, small island republics, small landlocked countries, LDCs, have the most expensive broadband and the, we the weakest. So you pay dearly for low quality. How to address the challenges of policy prioritizing the relevant investments, how to prioritize sound partnerships and opportunities for impact investment to address these challenges remains a major daunting challenge for us. But on the flip side of it is that the honeymoon where there was a blind embrace of technology as a panacea of human problems is over. As we learned from our very unquestioning embrace of an equal, flawed globalization, we are at a time in history when we must ask ourselves challenging questions. How can we find sufficient balance between incentivizing innovators, players, to continue driving inclusion while not sacrificing responsibility of regulators to keep away the, co the, the, the illegal commercialization of confidential personal data, uh, abuse of privacy rules or where they don't exist, adequate and enforceable private rules. So this balancing act becomes our major challenge. We must em embrace the critical historical moment with the, the platform electronic giants as major drivers and smaller enterprises growing out of this technology as major enablers of enterprise and wealth creation. But we must find a way that addresses both inclusion and integrity without slaying that same phenomenon that is going to create the wealth that we are aspiring to is inclusive. 
We will have the discussions. I just want to open this way that we find concrete ways that are actionable, that can lead towards recommendations of a policy nature, and even recommendations and incentivization of investment to deal with the developmental challenge, but also to deal with abuse of weak regulatory frameworks. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kituyi. So, um, in fact, I will ask one question, the same question, and I will address the same question to uh, the different five panelists in order for us to see a little bit what they think about uh, the importance and why should it, is it important for digital um, platforms to develop and how it can help development. So I, I change, uh, I turn to Nick. I will, I will go simply from Nick um, to um, Mr. Roberto Azevedo, so it will be uh, easier. Nick, so why do you think that it's important? Uh, well, we all talk about data as being the new sort of oil today. Uh, platforms are the new oil rig, effectively. Uh, I think platforms are designed to basically siphon off as much data uh, as possible. Uh, so the very nature of a platform business model is that it is an intermediary between a number of different groups. So Facebook, for instance, positions itself as an intermediary between users on one hand, advertisers, developers, all sorts of different groups. But by positioning itself as an intermediary, it is therefore in a position to capture all of the data about those interactions between those different groups. So this is, I think, a really interesting reason for why platforms have emerged in the past five, 10 years, is because they are specifically designed to pick up as much data as possible. Now, I am the bearer of bad news here because I think platforms have a number of key problems. The most important one is that they, uh, they have a tendency to monopolize. They monopolize, first of all, because of network effects. So the more people who use a platform, the more valuable that platform becomes. This leads to a winner-takes-all tendency within any sort of platform industry. Uh, Facebook is, again, a good example. You may hate what Mark Zuckerberg is doing. You may be really worried about privacy issues. But if you're going to join a social media network, it's going to be Facebook because all your family and friends are already on it. That's the power of network effects. Now, the second aspect is that these companies are also uh, building data moats. Because they can collect so much data, they can improve their services, they can cut costs, they can beat any competitor that doesn't have access to that data. Now, the third reason is path dependency. Because these companies are building up all this power, you start getting all the different sides of the platform designing their se themselves towards that platform. So developers working towards building on Facebook, users putting all their profile information on Facebook, which makes it incredibly difficult to then leave Facebook even if you wanted to. You also have, for instance, journalism and media organizations who have completely redesigned their businesses to orient towards the Facebook newsfeed. So they cut off all sorts of investigative reporting, they reorient towards video, and this makes them reliant upon Facebook uh, as the way to get their news out. So I think this path dependency means, again, you have one winner in any platform industry. Now, for me, the really worrying aspect is that platforms are not just something which exists within the tech world. Increasingly, they're becoming in, coming into the non-tech world as well. So Uber is a really good example. 10 years ago, nobody would have thought taxi driving was a fascinating industry. Suddenly, Uber has now turned it into this uh, fashionable, trendy industry that's worth billions, but that's because they've turned it into a platform. And we're seeing this now in agriculture, we're seeing this in manufacturing, we're seeing this across the entire economy. Companies like GE and Siemens and Monsanto and John Deere now turning into platforms. And that monopoly tendency comes with them. And I think we need to be worried about that, particularly in terms of development. So Nick, thank you for the good and the bad news. Uh, but I'll turn, um, maybe I'll turn to Dinesh, because Dinesh, uh, not only as I introduced him, um, has that wonderful, uh, huge platform in India um, that's brought a positive aspect in India. Uh, we have to remember, I have to remember you that India is the second largest online market in the world. And so I would like uh, you to share with us how you, you've in fact realized how uh, these digital platform can boost um, trade and development. Given the agenda of the 
today is development dimensions of digital platform. I really didn't want to start on a uh, negative side. So let me give you some positives of the digital platforms that we have been able to. India has only 30-35% penetration of internet, is still the sec second largest internet user base. Just to give you an idea, about 40 times bigger the population of Switzerland is the Indian internet population at just 33% of the uh, penetration. Also, think of these digital platforms. Without them, how rural consumers and rural businesses were deprived of the information, the access to goods and services that are available to them because of these digital platforms. These digital platforms have enabled small artisans from towns and villages across the India and across the world in rural India, uh, rural locations to market their products beyond their local mandi or beyond their local bazaars. It has been possible because of internet and because of this data as an oil that you, we call today. I firmly believe that internet has the power to change, empower the girl child, empower the farmers, empower the healthcare, empower the education. When I see young girls in the remote villages of India carrying uh, smartphones and uh, very happily doing small learning courses like English courses as well as mathematics courses. You know, today internet is not about only entertainment and commerce. Though we are in an e-commerce week, but it has a lot more dimensions to education, to access to cheaper technology, and access to the markets, and access to finance also. Earlier, small and medium enterprises, you know, we have in India about 50 million small and medium enterprises. About 20-25% of them are using internet and digital platforms for their communication and business needs. In a survey, it has been found that those who use internet for their business communication and business promotion, they are most likely to grow 50% higher than their peers. Also, they are more likely to be 50% higher profitable than their peers. So there are many, many benefits that internet and digital platforms as economy have done it. I understand the pitfalls around data, trust, and monopolization are such questions which are pending for us. India, for example, you know, in the hindsight has taken two or three very, very important initiatives about eight to 10 years ago. One of them was Aadhaar. Aadhaar is a digital identification of every citizen in India. Today, more than 1.1 billion people have their identification using Aadhaar. It is a digital identification with fingerprints and eyes as biometric identification. And it is easily verifiable across the bank accounts, across the telecom circle. Number two, India has given the license, demonopolized the data. We had about more than half a dozen telecom licenses. And today, in the last three years, India has become the cheapest data provider, data access provider in the world. At about $2 a month, you can get 1 GB data every day on every um, smartphone. Mm -hmm. So these are the benefits that has been given. This e identification. The third one is Internet uh, National Payment Corporation of India, which has resulted in creation of great immediate mobile payment systems. Now, these are the three major initiatives of government of India have given a very good platform for Indian e-commerce and Indian platforms to uh, provide services to the rural areas and to the education and to the health and to many other, uh, many other societies of, uh, strata of society. 
Thank you. Thank you, Danish. Um, Dr. Johnson, so why do the development of the digital uh, platform matters? Thank you. Um, I would agree with uh, Danesh in the sense that um, it really is a tremendous opportunity for us to accelerate the productivity of our small and medium scale businesses. When you look at the structure of most economies in, in Africa and other emerging markets, there are millions of, and sometimes tens of millions in India, 50 million in Nigeria, you're talking about 20 million or so, tens of millions of SMEs that are contributing a very small percentage of GDP. And that's because they're not that productive, whether it's in terms of access to markets or access to finance. Now, what these platforms do is two things. First of all, by providing the infrastructure for them to access markets, uh, they're able to be more productive so that their immediate, their market is not their immediate vicinity, but it's actually, as Danish's uh, platform shows, it's a, it's a vicinity that is several, you know, tens of miles away from where they are and they can expand their, their businesses. I think the second thing that it, that it, uh, that it does is when you look at um, a companies, some of the companies that we have invested in as, as, VC, uh, as, as VCs, they, use, they actually can bring in many of those players into the formal economy. And when you're in the formal economy, your access to finance is actually a lot easier than it, than it, than it is because they don't have data on you than, than if you want. So for instance, one of the companies that we've invested in is a platform for um, small retail traders that trade fruit and vegetables in, in Kenya. So one of our potential investments in Kenya, it brings them into, it provides a platform for them to first of all, order their, um, their, their vegetables on a daily basis. They aggregate the farm, they aggregate the produce from the farmers, deliver it to them where they are instead of them going to a market. But as they do this every day, what it begins to show is a financial pattern. It shows how much they sell every day. You're able to use that data. This is big data again. You're able to use that data to create a credit score for these um, uh, small retailers who are, not, who are in the informal markets. And by uh, doing a credit score, you then are able to lend them money. They can then increase the size of their businesses and you bring them into the formal economy. So th I think that's one of the biggest advantages of platforms. Uh, first, uh, to, to accelerate uh, um, the, the productivity of SMEs and also to bring the SMEs into the formal, into the formal economy. Um, I think the other thing that we're seeing is that, you know, platforms allow us to solve what I would term the grand challenges of many of the emerging economies, grand challenges around agriculture, the agriculture value chain that, that, is, that, are, that are broken in many parts of the emerging economies from, from farm all the way to plate. The inefficiencies actually make agricultural produce much more expensive in Africa and other emerging economies than they are in the developed world. Platforms enable us to, um, to, to provide access to um, education, for instance, there are platforms that actually support, you know, people, uh, um, uh, services being provided on educational platforms that complement uh, um, teaching in, in classrooms. So they, they provide that access to solving those grand challenges. Um, I think the final thing that I would like to say is, while there are many challenges, of course, uh, you know, the, the Facebook ones being the, you know, the, the most uh, kind of present in our minds today, but also many of the other platform companies that are dominating their markets and disrupting their markets, and really, in a sense, crowding out some of the competition in those, in those markets. I think for us, we need to look at this very carefully because it's an opportunity for us to learn. Whenever we talk about developing economies and technology, we talk about leapfrogging. We don't, we don't have all the baggage, we don't have all the, um, all the history, and we can do things on a clean slate. I think one thing that we should be wary about is as we see these platforms developing, and many of them that I have seen have the capacity to be actually very dominant because they can scale across the, the continent and they have the capacity to crowd out the way that we're seeing right now. But I think because this is happening ahead of us, we have the opportunity to learn from what is the, 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 the difficulties and the challenges that you very, you know, you're very well articulated. And by understanding those challenges, we can, we can actually work with... Um, uh, regulators, policymakers, and ensure that we don't make those kind of mistakes. The consumer in Africa is much less educated or aware of the uh, of the dangers of putting your, your your data and yourself on the internet than the consumers in many developing parts developed parts of the world. And so, for us, it's an opportunity for us to learn, so that when we when these platforms begin to scale, we can actually. Uh, have the appropriate regulation that doesn't stifle innovation and the appropriate policies that enable us to have many of these platforms competing uh, fairly against each other and providing the services that, Af uh, that, that people in emerging economies really need at a cost that actually makes sense. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Johnson. Um, I turn now to Roberto Azevedo, the Director General of the World Trade uh, Organization. Yeah, well, thank you very much. 
<coughs> I'm sorry. Uh, first of all, let me thank uh, UNCTAD for the invitation. Um, I am very happy to be here, and, and more than that, I think this kind of conversation, this kind of discussion, uh, complements very well what we're doing in the WTO. While there, um, members are more focused on the on the side of um, um, how 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 to make rules, how to to develop disciplines and things like that that could help. Um, I think uh, it is important that we also have uh, the kind of conversation more open-minded, more broad-based, like the ones that we're having uh, today. So that's very welcome. Um, I I would say that uh, uh, when we talk about e-commerce, um, I, I see it as an, an inevitability. Um, this is just something that is going to happen. It's already happening. It's going to be much more uh, present uh, in our lives than, than today. Um, just between 2013 and 2015, uh, e-commerce grew by 38%. So we're talking about two years, 38%. And that kind of pace is going to continue. Um, and the, the degree uh, of pervasiveness is going to increase. Um, if you look at e-commerce around the world today, uh, only 10%, so only 10% of the e-commerce is business to consumer. The other 90% is business to business. Of that 10%, of that 10%, only 7%, so 0 0.07, is crossing borders. The rest is domestic. It's merely in the national markets. So the potential for growth is tremendous, and it is going to happen, and there is no holding back. Now, if that is the situation, there is good news and bad news. I think the bad news is that um, this is going to grow much faster than, than anybody ever imagined. Uh, the good news is uh, this is in the beginning, um, and we have time uh, to avoid the distortions. And the, um, the bad sign, the bad side of this, which is sometimes concentration of, um, of, um, of, of power in the hands of a few, uh, it is about um, lack of privacy in many ways. Uh, that is not regulated, that is not uh, ensured to the consumer, uh, the rights of the consumer that need to be protected as well. So there are many challenges uh, in this conversation. Now, what I do believe is that if we cross our arms, uh, then the scenario that Nick just painted is the one that is going to prevail. Um, we want to make sure, at least certainly from my perspective, and I suppose from the perspective of most WTO members, we want to make sure that this phenomenon um, leads to two things. Leads to development, so that it helps countries to develop and to find, in this scenario, an opportunity uh, to, to leapfrog uh, uh, steps of the development process. And the second one is that this development is as inclusive as possible, so that it's about uh, providing real opportunities for the small players who now have their costs of, of engaging in, 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 in trade flows reduced. So distances decrease, uh, they all have a window in the world, so it's much easier now. But these things are not going to come by themselves. If you don't provide the infrastructure, the hard infrastructure, the soft infrastructure, if you don't have the capacity uh, in the SMEs, in the small and medium enterprises to be uh, navigating and participating in the digital world, uh, you are going to see those being marginalized uh, even more. So that's what we, ne we need to try to avoid. Uh, and that's the kind of conversation that I think uh, we need to have in order to ensure that this is, that we take the right course. Thank you, Roberto. Like you said, uh, it's very important for the SMEs, and uh, uh, I don't know if you're aware that um, um, ITC, International Trade Center, just released a report uh, that uh, they've uh, worked with the Ali Research. Um, Ali Research has used the Alibaba data. Alibaba is the largest uh, online uh, B2B uh, marketplace, uh, Chinese, and uh, it's very interesting to see how, uh, in fact, that digital platf these digital platforms help to boost uh, trade and development uh, in uh, LDCs um, countries uh, in Asia. And we have, uh, we're very lucky to have some ministers of these countries that are mentioned in that uh, report here and that we'll, we'll, 
uh, talk with them, we'll give them the floor a little bit later. But I turn to Danish again, and I would like uh, to, to know, as, as um, Dr. Johnson mentioned, uh, the importance um, for India when you started uh, your business and that the existence of your platform, how does it affect it positively or not the SMEs? Dr. Johnson just spoke about the fact that it helps also the MSMEs to get into uh, uh, the, the formal um, domain of business. So what can you share with us? And also maybe you could tell us about the, the level of penetration of uh, the internet to make a little bit of comparison of what's existing in some countries or like uh, Dr. Kitui uh, told us uh, before. As I said earlier, there are 50 million SMEs approximate in India, and there are approximately 100 million SMEs in China. In China, the internet adoption of by MSMEs is almost like 80%. However, in India, there is only 25% adoption by MSMEs in India. So that makes it only 10 to 12 million SMEs who are using email or internet for their business communication or promotion or both. Out of that, at India Mart, we have been able to list about 5 million, which is 50% of the internet-enabled SMEs on India Mart. Today, with around 55 million buyers coming to India Mart, we make 1 million plus buyer and supplier matchmaking every day which results into in approximate about 10 billion worth of GMB being transacted across the year, which is about half percent of the Indian GDP uh, for that matter. Now, coming to the uh, question of how it is benefiting small and medium enterprises across and how it is be benefiting exporters, there is a, when there are platforms like these are created, there are Benefits for all. There is a accrual of benefit for the smallest of the uh, smallest of the enterprise trader. Why? Because he gets an equal opportunity to advertise his products and services as against the uh, larger corporates. For larger corporates, they were able to access only a certain set of market which are feasible until now in the absence of internet. Because of the absence of internet, they are able to access to the remotest part of India, remotest part of the country uh, by distributing their product or by selling their product to that place. Earlier, they would not, it would not make sense for them to have a dealership or distributorship in a place which has only few uh, population or very small population. Now, because of the e-commerce, they are able to access a very remotest part of the uh, country. The remote parts of the country, which were earlier paying very high prices, as uh, Mr. Secretary said, that in the rural parts, you pay high prices for lower quality of goods. That has been tried to be eliminated by way of internet because you are able to pay the same price as you are paying in Delhi or Mumbai or in China at the remotest part of the world. We should learn from the Chinese uh, development uh, how hundreds of their companies have become over a billion dollar uh, in revenue and with the shared economy. Shared economy in terms of umbrellas, I know that one failed, uh, in terms of mobikes, in terms of not only cars, we are, we are only talking cars, but mobile is a very big segment. Food ordering, food delivery is a very segment. So there are so many segments where MSMEs are getting uh, benefited. Now come to export. Earlier, export marketing was a very, very expensive proposition. One has to go to uh, go through either the embassies or one has to go through the uh, trade fairs which are happening in uh, China or Germany or other parts of the world. Participation in a trade fair cost uh, millions of rupees or uh, tens of thousands of dollars for any SMEs. That creates an entry barrier for an SME into the export business. By way of internet, uh, he is able to 
use a few couple of hundred dollars to advertise his products and services across the world and access to the market which are available either from uh, North America or from South America or from Europe or from Australia or from uh, rest of the Asia. So there has been access to the market which has been opened. You know, for the first 10, 15 years at India Mart, we were largely focused on export-import business only because India had less than 10 million internet users. Only after it became 10 million plus internet users, we launched domestic uh, B2B services. And today, 80% of our uh, buyer and suppliers are uh, domestics. Another important thing is, as uh, mentioned, these digital trails are created for SMEs because for every transaction, for every inquiry, for every uh, transaction that they do, a digital trail is created. <coughs> Earlier in the unorganized world, there was no trail and hence the financing was very, very difficult. Any financing by any financial institute has to happen based upon your digital transaction record. And if there is no digital uh, the transaction record, if there is no transaction record, it is the, it is the financial institute inability to for fund you because they do not able to differentiate between the uh, higher uh, trading volume SMEs and lower trading volume SMEs. Because of this digital uh, platforms, there is a lot of transaction is being created and which, are, which can be accessed by banks. So it creates a lower and access to the technology. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for these elements. And I, I turn again to, to Nick, because um, Nick, now that we've heard uh, different perspectives, do you think that uh, the challenges and the risks are the same? Because when you listen to uh, a representative of India uh, or of Africa, uh, for the moment, um, the, the platforms, digital platforms are more used as a tool for business. Um, is it the same? Is it the same use? Do we have the same use in the other countries? And are the risks the same? Uh, are the challenges the same? Could you please um, tell us a little bit more about it and what uh, you found with uh, your research? Hmm. So I, I will say I think a lot of the benefits of platforms that have been discussed are accurate. I think that uh, fundamentally platforms reduce transaction costs. And this is why they've become so popular amongst people that use them, is because it makes it easier to do international trade, it makes it easier to exchange communication. They do fundamentally offer this, these benefits. I think the real issue, though, is, is uh, uh, how extensive are these benefits for consumers and workers in particular, and how extensive are those benefits for the owners of the platforms? Uh, I think if you look at the developed world, what you see is a lot of people gaining benefits from something like Uber, something like Facebook, something like Amazon, but most of the value goes to the owners of those platforms. And I think this is what's really sort of worrisome, is that this sort of emphasis on just getting access and getting platforms out without thinking about how they may be concentrating power and wealth, I think that we need to really be taking that sort of stuff into account beyond just saying that getting more access is obviously beneficial. It is beneficial, but we need to look at it how it's structured in the right and appropriate ways. Uh, the other sort of aspect as well is um, an emphasis on innovation and startups and things like this. Uh, again, I think there's lots of benefits to be had from that, but we should also recognize that this is a relatively small area. If we look, for instance, in America, most tech startups employ very few people. If you look at, for instance, the employment statistics in America about programmers, programming is supposed to be the future of you know, the job world. Only 2% of Americans do a job that involves programming, which is just above agriculture in America. So I think this sort of idea that tech startups and all these other things are necessarily going to bring a lot of employment opportunities is possibly mistaken. We need to be a bit so, uh, uh, concerned about that. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Kituyi. I, I, I want this to be a bit more nuanced about uh, the distribution of benefit on, 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 on the efficiency economy. Uh, even look at the example concretely of Uber. I know one case in my country, Kenya. 
the first thing that Uber did in arriving in the Kenyan market is to cut down the cost of taxis by 50%. The second is to force the taxi companies to upgrade their cars because it's a benchmark of quality acceptable by Uber. It raises the quality of and appetite of the consumer. And the third thing was the generation of local competition for Uber. So uh, indeed, the operators of the platform get more than their fair share of the benefit from the, 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 that interaction. But in this particular case, you are seeing a domestication of a similar model which becomes basically a, a normal marketplace competition. But there's something I wanted to mention also here. We have seen this side, and it, it was put very well by George Soros at Davos early this year, that the addiction from the platform giants is a worse addiction than narcotics. They first arrest your attention. They addict you. And they drive your attention towards their commercial interests. They make you start looking for what they want you to see. Now, having said that, there's also another reality, that the efficiencies of the global economy today are being driven by aggregators of data. Look, we can't wish it away that in spite of the weaknesses in the rising sun, we must stare at it. That those who are not having a role in it, those who are disengaged, remain the most vulnerable. So how do we purposefully structure not only a consciousness that this is not an ideal world, but also maximizing what benefit can possibly come out of it. And I want to just suggest some examples of some things that we can do. We at UNCTAD have started this E-Trade for All initiative. And in a component of it is this rapid E-Trade preparedness studies of countries, particularly LDCs, that by creating possibilities for countries to see their weaknesses in collecting and generating and collecting data, even on the, the depth of the digital economy in their own territory, by showing the skill set limits, by showing the payment system weaknesses, you give them areas which, where challenges can be turned into investment opportunities. And we want more engagement on how can we fill these spaces? How can we convert this need into a bankable project at one level of discourse? It's second level of discourse. How do we finance inclusion? I saw a very interesting example from uh, Sweden, Sweden last year. There is part of ODA from Sweden is being given as uh, project accelerator funds. That a grant from the Swedish government kind of de-risks investments in otherwise vulnerable markets so long as it's directed in areas of interest. Now, the only problem we have is if you look at all the ODA organizations around the world, when you tell them about their policy on ICT, it's about funding their own internal use of computers. They, they still remain analog in their relationship to the developing world. So we must start saying, can we go beyond funding to financing? Beyond the house to being relevant so that the risking can also go, go into infrastructure for digital economy in the developing countries. And the final thing I wanted to say about this is um, we must get to a point where peer influence starts pushing what we do together. I've seen, like in Africa, the NEPAD peer review mechanism. If we triggered a situation where in ASEAN countries, leaders will come and explain how much we have been more inclusive for our people, even knowing that there are some things we have to mitigate, it becomes a useful narrative about what is wrong and what's right. I'll give you what's wrong with some of this technology. In my own country, Kenya, people celebrate that there's mobile money. It has done a lot of good things. Every older person can now receive a minimum pension because of the cost of transfer is very minimal to government. But there's also another truth. The mobile service providers are giving the most expensive micro loans to consumers in the country. And what do we see? It is too small for small business. And the other consumer who has the ease of money is a consumer who is borrowing money to gamble, to bet. So when you have legislated betting, and you have easy access, expensive microcredits. The category of persons who use that phenomenon are not creating wealth. They are gambling lives away. I mean, that these are exchanges we can have, but along the way we know there are corrective measures and there are positives we can try to build in the dialogue. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you, Dr. Kituyi. So, Nick, you wanted to react? Uh, yeah, just very quickly on Uber, because Uber does come into a city and undercuts every price, but of course they take a loss, and this is classic monopoly behavior to undercut other competitors. So they've done that as part of their strategy. Uh, I don't think it's necessarily something to laud as being a good thing, um, because once they get rid of competitors, they can jack up the prices. The other thing, of course, is workers. So. The, the pay may seem very, very high, but of course workers have to pay for all the maintenance costs of the car, they have to pay for sick pay, they have to pay for everything else, they don't get any benefits. It turns out they end up making less than minimum wage. So these aren't good jobs that are being produced by Uber, and I think we need to be aware of that. We've spoken a lot uh, about Africa, that's the reason why I turned to uh, Dr. Johnson to tell us, um, to, to, to share with us her experience in Nigeria, but also the role of the government, because uh, do the government, does the government have to support uh, the, the, the development uh, of the digital um, platforms? How can, can uh, the, the government inform their people about the risks um, of uh, being part of it? Like Dr. Kitui just uh, gave us uh, some examples. Um, what could you share with us? Sure. I mean, the answer is, is yes. <laughs> But be before, I, before I answer that, I'd like us to just, I wanted to go a step, a few steps back. And that is, um, when we talk about uh, digital platforms, we, we, we tend to use examples of Facebook and Uber, which are great global platforms. But we also need regional or national platforms. And the thing we need to understand is that these platforms take tremendous amount of capital to create. So I, when you look at the Facebooks and the Ubers of this world, they have deployed billions of dollars of capital to get to where they are. And so when we start thinking about the benefits of, 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 uh, of digital platforms, we also need to begin to think about how do we fund the development of these, of, these, um, of, these, of these platforms? There's not enough capital available in Africa to build the kind of platforms that we want to build that will you know, engage you know, hundreds of millions of people, that will help SMEs be more productive and all of that. There's not enough capital. We need to remember, we need to remember that. And also the mindset of, you know, um, I think Amazon is yet to turn a profit. Uh, Uber is yet to turn a profit because they're able to deploy, they're able to attract and deploy huge amounts of capital that don't require them to make a profit, but require them to just get more customers and get more, get more business. So that's the first thing to say that as we look at this uh, digital dimensions, um, sorry, development dimensions of digital platforms, we need to look at how do we get more capital in the continent to build these platforms. I think the second thing to also think about is how do we get more of whether uh, it's individuals or SMEs that actually uh, use these platforms? And I think that adoption is based on content. So if we take the example of India, for instance, where penetration is low, but when you look at the size of the continent, there are a lot of people that have access to the, to the internet. One of the big things that drives utilizing that access is what is available on the internet. So people would go to the internet if it makes sense for me to use an Uber cab than it is to use a, a normal cab because it's cheaper, it's faster, and all of that. So one of the other things we need to do is to, and this is what governments can do, is to encourage entrepreneurs to develop content and businesses around the internet that will attract SMEs and individuals to use this infrastructure and get the benefits that we're all speaking about. I think those are two very important points that I, I didn't want us to, uh, uh, to miss. And just not so much to argue with you, Nick, but around the, um, the job creation potential there is a tremendous amount of job creation potential. And I want to use an example of a company that we have uh, invested in. Uh, um, I was going to make, let me just step back a little bit. When I talk about national and regional platforms, we all know about Google, as, about Uber and, uh, and Facebook. Their platforms, you know, nobody's probably heard about Tarragon, M-Survey, uh, Twiga. These are platforms that are being developed that I think, in our opinion, are going to be the unicorns and the billion dollar businesses in Africa. And we need to pay attention to them and give them capital. For, point of view of creating jobs. Again, when you, when you look at these companies, they have a tremendous number of developers that are working to build these platforms. What is happening in many emerging economies now and what we see is that we don't have the skills. We need these platforms. We don't have the skills to build these platforms. And so what happens is that we have these platforms, but the development and the, uh, the software development, the coding is done outside of the continent. And that's a challenge that we, we, need, to, we need to address. Because we need to address that because <clears throat> this is an opportunity to, to create jobs and to create not just the kind of low-level jobs uh, that, we, that you talked about, but the high-level, highly skilled jobs. 
In the US, um, there are one million software engineering vacancies that they cannot fill. In Europe, it's the same. There's a company called Andela that is actually training young Africans, giving them high uh, world-class development, de software development skills, and they are outsourcing those individuals to companies in the US and Europe. They're not going to those countries, they're actually staying in the continent through technology, working with the teams, embedded in the teams in the US and Europe, but they have these fantastic, very high level skills. And that's the opportunity that some of these things provide for us. And we need to just look at them as a means that there is an opportunity to create jobs, but a different kind of job than the ones that we have created in the, in the past. You know, what should governments do? I think governments need to pay attention to, um, you know, the things that I've just said, the need for capital, the need for skills, uh, and the need for content. And to engage with the industry to see how do we intervene in a manner that actually accelerates any one of these things. It could be to provide seed capital to some of these funds. It could be to look at some of the curriculum in our, in our secondary schools, in our universities, that address the skills that we need to build these digital platforms. And, and, and finally, it could be around um, uh, understanding the kind of jobs that are going to be created for the future and building um, skills development initiatives, I know that some of that is going on right now and I'd be so happy to hear from some of the ministers here, building initiatives that will help us to address some of those skills in, in, a, in a continent that has that boast about a youth bulge, but really doesn't leverage that youth bulge. Thank you, Mobola. Thank you. Um, Roberto, you wanted to react to the different uh, Well, just, just to add something, maybe. Uh, we, well, if you think back at the Industrial Revolution, uh, back to the 18th century, um, it revolutionized the way that the society interacted with itself. Uh, and companies, of course, uh, all of a sudden, it was not a small shop in the corner. There were big companies who had the production line. Uh, there were social challenges. There were regulatory challenges. Now, those were developed over centuries, actually. Now, what we're seeing now is a similar uh, restructuring of society. Uh, whether you notice it or not, that's a different conversation, but it is there. So practices are going to emerge, uh, which will be a big challenge uh, for governments, for consumers. Um, I, I think having mega corporations and concentration of uh, standards in the hands of a few is something that needs to be looked into. Uh, but we, we cannot just simply reject that, uh, because this is also something that is improving and reducing the costs of uh, citizens worldwide. Um, while we understand the challenges, for example, of Uber or, or, or some other platforms, the reality is that the consumer is spending less. Uh, his salary has just increased because they're not spending so much on certain services which are now being provided at a cheaper um, way, in a cheaper way. Now, does that introduce other types of distortion? That's something that we need to take a look at. Um, I don't think that simply because of the fact that um, a company is making a lot of money on something, that doesn't mean that society as a whole is not making even more money. Uh, and the economy is actually being leveraged uh, even further uh, than that particular company. Uh, so we have to be careful when we look at that. All I'm saying is, um, we need to look, for example, the, 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 the rules and the, and, the, um, and the regulatory environment is not keeping up. Uh, I'll give you one example. I, I have seen in some countries um, the, the effort to export being hampered by regulatory environment. For example, you, one, one clear thing, when you, when you do a, a business to consumer uh, transaction crossing the border, there is one very important element that just disappeared, which is the importer. In the past, if there would be an importer in the other country, and if the consumer had a problem, he would go to the importer. And we knew very clearly that's the laws of that country. The importer had the responsibility to take care of the consumer. Now, that disappeared. Now, who does the consumer turn to? Uh, in some countries, for example, you can't return the merchandise. Uh, so I buy a shirt, the shirt is too large or too small, uh, and I want to return to the, to the supplier in another country. And that country sometimes doesn't accept the merchandise back. 
And then what happens? Uh, so all these things, they are changing the way we do things. I'm sure that India Mart has that kind of challenge. Uh, other companies do have that kind of challenge. The reality is that the regulatory environment is not keeping up. And we need to put this conversation because when I go to, to countries and I talk about this, quite often I say things that the authorities are not even aware of. So this is the kind of uh, awareness raising that we have to have. And this kind of conversation, this kind of uh, interaction here is precisely the kind of thing that we need to make sure that we, we, we maximize the benefits of society and minimize the risks. Yes, uh, Roberto, yeah, you're right uh, about uh, informing uh, the governments, uh, the authorities, uh, because as we know, sometimes uh, people that are based in Geneva know a lot about uh, what's going on at WTO, but it's not always the case back in the countries when you have to deal with these matters. But when you look at, uh, you, you were speaking about revolution, so that digital revolution, these uh, digital platforms, do you think that they are going to increase multilateralism now that we've seen that uh, recently you have more the move of protec protectionism, uh, particularly between United States and China. I mean, you spoke about it when you released your uh, latest report last week um, on the perspectives for 2018 and 2019. I, th I think the world is going to be much more integrated and interconnected than, than ever. Uh, what we're seeing now is just the early steps of this kind of integration. Uh, today, in the real physical world, uh, two-thirds of, of, of trade is somehow connected to the global value chains. That means the components, at least once, they cross the border between one country and another. Digitally, forget it, digitally that's peanuts. Uh, this is going to be much, much, much bigger. And I think that it's inevitable that at some point in time, you're going to need some kind of international coordination or cooperation to handle these, these challenges. These challenges are inevitable. Now, and I, in the WTO, I see a lot of that. A lot of countries are already discussing this. The question is whether your country, whether that authority wants to be part of the thinking that is going to shape the world for the future or not. Mm -hmm. And that's a decision that they have to take. But that this is coming, I have no doubts in my mind. And the more I travel, the more I talk to people, the more I'm convinced uh, that we are already behind. Okay, Danish. Very a few few words, yeah, <laughs> because I mean, I'd like to turn to the ministers that we have with us. I'm only saying that platforms have always been existed. There have been uh, platforms like financial platforms, like few couple of banks which had the power of lending money. There has been media platforms like print platforms and television media platforms which have been too powerful. There has been telecom. You know, I remember. In United States, at one point of time, AT&T had to be uh, splitted into 20 baby bells uh, to create uh, bell, bell companies like that. So the platforms have always been existed. Microsoft has dealt with, uh, you know, monopoly uh, platform having uh, Microsoft Windows as one of the most important platform. And if we are afraid of creating platform uh, and afraid of losing job, then we are least prepared in the era of upcoming artificial intelligence, uh, blockchain, and robotics kind of a ecosystem. In the next 10 years or 20 years, there is going to be uh, autonomous drivers, uh, driver, driverless cars. There, has, there would be uh, waiterless uh, restaurants. There would be waiterless uh, hotels. I know if we are afraid of dealing with platforms, how are we going to deal with uh, these new technologies which are upcoming and looming large at our uh, horizon, which is coming soon. I think the only way for us is to empower every small and medium enterprise, every micro enterprise, every person in the remotest part of the world to have access to the education, you know, the best quality of education that he can have. And the only way, we cannot produce teachers and we cannot produce content uh, by every government. The only way they can be, uh, have access to the best quality of education is by way of digital. Because there are 
platforms like uh, created by Stanford University, platforms like created by where the bestest of the teachers are teaching you courses and you can have access to them either free of cost or at a very fractional of cost. Earlier you would have to travel all the way to get that education. So I would say that internet should not be questions. Digital platform should not be questioned. Yes, we need to take measures by the government at time to time when any of the platforms become too big or too pervasive, what all different activities needs to be done, whether need, they need to be splitted, what kind of policies need to be created. We need not worry about creation of a monster without the monster being created. I think it is uh, too early for us. There are benefits which are 90 to 10 as against the uh, problems. As the problems will emerge, we will deal with it. You know, I am sure the uh, government will be able, government across the world would be able to deal with it. Currently, for the least development, least developed countries, it is very difficult to access to capital like we have available in the India, China, or United States. You know, we can't have uh, capital available for small, small African countries or small, small. Uh, European countries because their overall market size isn't enough, big enough for a platform to survive. And that is where it is a very important how these smaller countries are going to deal with it. You know, for larger countries, at least the access to capital can create their own platforms. China has created their own platforms. Uh, United States has created global platforms. There are few platforms being created by, from Europe which are becoming global. India has created many of its own platforms uh, like Paytm, Ola, uh, Book My Show, India Mart, and many other, you know, IRCTC. How would smaller countries, whether developed or whether least developed, they will be able to create their platform? And for them, it is a bigger question how to deal with digital platforms, how to deal with whether to create their own platform or whether to partner with the existing large country platforms or how to deal with that. So it is bigger question for smaller countries, whether developed or least developed. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much. So now I turn to, to the room, like we see at the beginning um, of this event. So we are very fortunate to have different uh, representatives, ministers of trade and commerce of uh, countries. And um, um, I will ask, first of all, a question to a, a first group of, of ministers. And uh, we have the Minister of Commerce of Cambodia, uh, Mr. Pan Sorasak. We have uh, the Minister of Trade, Industry and Cooperatives of Uganda, uh, Mrs. Amelia Kiambade. And we have uh, a representative of uh, Liberia, um, Mr. Wilson uh, Tarpe, uh, Minister for Commerce, Industry uh, of Liberia. So we just spoke about the, um, the possibilities for the countries, is, are there opportunities or not? Uh, so I would like to ask you if uh, you're not scared to be left behind. Do you think that certain countries could be left behind um, or also companies? I turn maybe uh, to uh, the minister uh, to uh, Uganda, please, to uh, give you the floor. And you have to know that we are very lucky to have translation today. Uh, so, if you want to uh, listen to what uh, one of the panelists or ministers are saying, you can turn to one of the six official languages of UN that are uh, that you can get if you take your ear. So. Okay, thank you very much. Well, as we engage in all these dialogues, you realize that digital platforms are essential ingredients for economic development. Allow me to cite um, Uganda as a case study. The teledensity by end of 2016 stood at 64%. Internet access is 31.3% of the population, whereas 22 million subscribers are registered on mobile phone out of the estimated population of 41.5. Uganda has invested in national IT infrastructure, backbone, with the objective of reducing costs of data for high users. Of course, I must say that there are a number of, of initiatives, like introduction of e-government across, across the board to enable accessibility and provision of social services, 
electronic identification solution, electronic single window project, waiving of taxes on ICT-related equipment and various platforms, mapping of city and establishment of physical addresses. You look at financial inclusion through mobile money application, a unique innovation in East Africa. By 2017, mobile money transactions had reached US dollars 14.7 billion. Industrialization has also been enhanced by digitalization, agriculture, and education. But I'd like to point out a, a very important issue that sometimes we, we lament, but it's not time for lamentations. Our government also has to carry out interventions. We do not expect ANCTA to do things like a supportive and regulatory framework, incentive and formalizing MS, MSMEs through strength, strengthening trade-related e-government services, but also promote a large-scale learning system, infrastructure development that is also for a country. So the way forward in this is like the African proverb which says, a cob wakes up every morning and runs, thinking that the, elf, I mean, the lion will devour it. The lion wakes up to find food. So Africa must rise now. This is the digital era and we must catch up with it, otherwise we'll be devoured. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I don't know if you want the, of the panelists want to react to what has been said, no. So I'll turn to uh, the representative of Liberia, uh, the Minister of Trade and Commerce, Mr. Tarpe. Thank you very much, Madam uh, President, fellow uh, delegates. Well, first I want to thank you on behalf of the government for the invitation that extended us to be here, and we are glad to be here. Uh, you asked the question whether uh, we're going to be left behind. We don't think we want to be left behind. Even if we wanted to, we have a population that comprises young people who make up 78% below the age of 35. So even if we wanted to stay behind, those kids would be ha far ahead of us. The digital e-commerce situation in our country is very unique. We have a triangular arrangement, business to business, business to consumers, government to business. Our role as a government is to ensure that we put in the enabling environment for e-commerce to thrive. And we expect the private sector to do the rest of it. Interestingly, there is a low level of investment on the aggregate by the private sector to do that, and simply because the economy has been under severe strains. You all know that we've had 14, 15 years of war, and because of the, due to the assistance of the international community, we've been able to, to make it to this point. But we are making every effort to ensure that we can put in the necessary environment. What we're doing, what we are doing with the help of UNTAD and the rest of international partners is to put in a backbone. We now have a fiber optic backbone that we're trying to put in. It is developing. A few years ago, uh, UNCTAD, I will tell him, my brother Kitui, thank you for bringing in a platform where the management of our customs activities uh, was, was, was automated. And we can say that Asikuda now is a major development that is driving revenue administration in the country. As a government, we've decided to automate most of what we do so that the government, I mean, so that the private sector can be able to interact with us as far as the services we provide, tax collection, importation, exportation, and all of that. Last week, the president launched the platform for the payment of all taxes. You do no longer have to go to a bank. You can pick up your telephone, use mobile money to do that. Uh, we expect the businesses, which is the private sector, to be able to link onto that. Again, they are lagging behind because the level of investment, like my sister Johnson said, the level of investment required is a little slow yet. So this is where we are. And, 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 and the, 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 the other problem challenge that we have is we have a youthful population that is 
not able to make it by them by themselves. They need the assistance of the international community, and as a government, we are investing the low resource we have into technology-based uh, or curricula. As a matter of fact, we've had the universities to tailor down their curricula to the needs of the economy. So we now see an increasing number of ICT courses and programs being issued, I mean, being offered by the university. So this is where we are, and we look forward to the international communities to help us, especially on that that has been in the forefront. And finally, we've had, uh, based on the assistance from ONTA and other international partners, we are now linking onto the single window, the uh, fiscal device that would make it possible for revenues to be collected at source instead of giving two or three months for the taxpayer to come to the ministry. We hope we can continue to count on your, on your support. We are not there yet, but we are optimistic that e-commerce is the way to go. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for, for um, sharing all these important uh, information uh, after, like you say, the long period of war and also the Ebola outbreak that uh, did not help you uh, at that time. So is there anyone who want to react? Um, because it's obvious that they've catched the train. No? So I'll turn to another region to the... Uh, yes, Dr. Kituye? No? Okay. Doctor, um, so I'll turn now to another region, another part of the world, to uh, the Minister of uh, Trade of uh, Cambodia, Mr. Pan. First of all, I would like to uh, react on um, what um, the panelists uh, said about the uh, evolutions and revolutions of things. And I believe that uh, humanity cannot uh, stand still. And we are moving along with the uh, Industrial Re Revolutions 1.0, now it's Indu Industrial Revolution 4.0, uh, which uh, humanity has to, uh, to work and, uh, through these challenges. Of course, there are so many um, challenges that we have to go uh, and have to overcome. But all the time, people will uh, overcome on, on this. Now. Uh, with this, the, the advancement of uh, ICTs has fundamentally uh, changing traditional business models. The uh, emergence of uh, online, online platforms seems logical in the e-commerce context as they help facilitate trade exchanges by removing barriers of times, distance, lack of uh, information, and reducing costs. Um, you can see that farmers now in developing countries can nowadays have relevant information at their fingertips on the uh, like weather, uh, weather, uh, weather prices, access to auxiliary services the tip of, with the tip of their fingers. The online platforms can therefore be considered as the key drivers of innovations and ch change in the developing countries need to, uh, in order to reach the uh, the uh, agreed SDGs 2030. Uh, as for Cambodia, we uh, never afraid of uh, being a part of the uh, big boys uh, playing fields. We like to be part of that because we know that uh, by working with you, we have, we have kept our standard higher and uh, so that we can move forward what needs to be done uh, as far as on the ICT, on the e-commerce and so on. Uh, by not uh, being in a, uh, in a train, in a bandwagon, then you're going to miss. You're going to miss a lot of things. And um, they, they don't wait for you. So uh, we, uh, you ask, ask we, we should be scared of that. I don't think we should. Should not. Uh, we should. So with regard to uh, the uh, inclusions, yes, it's important that uh, the inclusivity is all across the board. We, uh, we need to uh, work that, uh, like you said, that said, we don't leave anyone behind. E-commerce is very important that allow women, young people, old people, anybody across the board to participate and do, uh, do business. And that's very important for us to, uh, to work. Of course, there's a lot of challenges like uh, um, DG uh, WTO mentioned about there's a, a lot of things that left behind, for example, like legal frameworks that Cambodia is, re, uh, is working on, like e-commerce draft uh, laws. 
like consumer protections that we need to uh, uh, insert and merge together because the consumer protection was going through only on the physical, physical um, commerce, not the cyberspace commerce, not the cyber commerce, which uh, we need to look into it. How could you uh, have a warranty across the, across the border? But this is all the challenges that humanity can do, can work, we can work together and the, the, the people can, should not be uh, uh, left alone. So more and more people and countries will be integrated and I, I believe that with this kind of uh, integrations, we can solve a lot of problems and especially on the e-commerce that Cambodian will embark. And it's gonna be a long journey for, uh, journey for us, but we'll, we'll be there. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you to the Minister Pan Sohasak from Cambodia. Roberto, uh, I know that you, you have to leave soon. Uh, do you want to react? Any reaction? Well, just to say that um, I, uh, what I just heard uh, from those three minutes is very encouraging, is the realization that uh, the country is big and small. They're all trying to do their best to not leaving their population behind, not leaving their entrepreneurs behind. I think the, what I heard in common also was the importance of inclusiveness, making sure that e-commerce develops in a way that offers an opportunity for everybody in society, uh, that small and medium enterprises are not left behind. And, um, and I fully share the views of the Minister of Cambodia in particular when he says that uh, participating in this conversation is something that is going to illustrate the government in taking the right action at the right time fast enough. Um, so I'm, I'm very encouraged from what I heard from, from, from all three of them. And um, all I can say is as far as the WTO is concerned, uh, whatever we can do to help, uh, also in the context of technical assistance, developing infrastructure, um, uh, capacity building, all that uh, is something that we're willing to do. And uh, their input uh, in this conversation for us is very important so that we understand the perspectives, the different perspectives. I do apologize that I, that I have to leave. Um, I'm spending on, only 24 hours in Geneva. Uh, so everything was compressed uh, in this day. Um, but I have to tell you in this hour and a half that we've been here, uh, I heard uh, many useful things. I wanted to be here precisely for that. Um, and I once again want to thank uh, Secretary General um, Kitui for the invitation. Uh, for the contributions that have been given by the other members of the panel, uh, the ministers here present, and I appreciate uh, this opportunity very, very much. Um, thank you very much, and I apologize once again if I cannot stay with you for the duration. Thank you. Thank you, Roberto. So we continue. We have some reactions. Uh, like I said, we're fortunate because we have other ministers here in the room, and uh, I have uh, the Minister of State of Information Technology and Telecommunication of Pakistan, Mrs. Anusha Rahman Khan. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for uh, allowing me this intervention and for this very uh, informative debate. Um, I raised a, f a few points after uh, interacting on different platforms. Um, my uh, uh, key takes are as follows. Number one, digitization has come as a revolution in many developing countries. It is not part of an evolution. It is not something that has taken place over many years. So what has happened is that countries have a technology revolution, but their laws, their regulations, their policy frameworks are in some cases 100 years old. So the countries, the governments, the public sector that is, is not been able to appreciate that what technology is doing is they have to keep pace with it in the same way. So when the technology is running at a speed of 100 kilometers, the, the laws, the regulations, and the rules are either not even walking or perhaps just sitting down. So there is definitely a need for a debate to see that how the technology interventions and the disruptive means that the technology is using to get engaged with are actually more ingrained into the system rather than being introduced from the top shelf. For example, when Uber comes in or when other digital platforms are coming in, even countries like Pakistan are finding it difficult that where actually this company sits in the federal government infrastructure, whether it's a technology company or whether it is a transportation company. Now, if 
If it is neither a technology company nor a transportation company, then what is it? And if it is nothing, that means that we are by our own action discouraging the digital platforms to be created. So the disruptive mechanisms need to be addressed on a very fast track, and we need to allow space to the technology uh, platform developers to be introduced in some way or the other, but definitely in a more inclusive approach. The second thing is that if the technology is going to continue to remain disruptive, we will not be able to make use of their existence in the sense that if technology is saying that I am going to be uh, selling and buying on the on the e-platforms, and if the countries are saying no, but we have the customs laws and we have the excise laws and we have the taxation laws, and, and the e-commerce platform becomes a marketplace in the real terms, but on one side they're providing access across global buying and selling at the same time, I just want to say that nobody knows how the technology is going to be like in two years' time. So we should not be too coercive in regulations and rules. Whilst we still need the regulatory frameworks and rules, but we should not be inhibiting the growth that the technology brings into the countries because of these disruptive means. So this whole psychology of dealing with trade dealing with uh, education, dealing with health, dealing with commerce needs to be rethought and we need to be looking in dialogue with the private sector, with the technology companies. Okay, what are your programs? How artificial intelligence is going to change the way of life? How IoT is going to change the way of life? How they perceive FinTech and robotics is going to change us is what we need to talk today so that the governments are equipped. But no matter how equipped we are, I still can assure you that we will never be equipped at the same way, the speed with which the technology is moving. And in Pakistan, I mean, we are are working very hard and we are connecting. I mean, I was less than 3% in broadband when I became minister. We are over 38% now in just three years' time. And we are working on the girls' uh, programs, bridging digital divide, br bringing e-commerce portal online. We've got people who are working on the demand side of the technology after having worked on the supply side. But what I can definitely say that the transformation instead of disruption is what we all need to be talking about. And if the, grow, if the, growth, is, is, the growth is only going to come through dynamism and participation, inclusive, together with the private sector, talking on the, on the platforms, and then, and then the most important point that I think I would like to emphasize on, that all these, uh, the UN, I'm very thankful to Mr. Kutui for having us and uh, giving us an opportunity to speak and inviting us uh, to share our experiences. But these experiences need to be translated for the benefit of many more people who are on the globe. So I've, I've requested uh, Madam uh, Edangta to, to actually set up a working, for, a working group of all those experiences that we may have in Nigeria, in, in Kenya, in Pakistan, in Bangladesh, et cetera, and see if we can actually, barring the fact that, you know, there are four components to it. One is infrastructure. How much optic fiber do you have? How much 3G, 4G you rollouts you're doing? The second part is computers. How many computers and mobile phones you have? How much human resource you, th these are constant factors. Just take it to a side. There is one very important aspect, which is the language of the computer, the coding, the cloud computing skills. Those are common. These are common to everybody. It's a universal language. This universal language is the key to the door of growth and success. And if we can actually make out a curriculum which is acceptable as a universal language for everybody else to get facilitated from UNCTAD or any other UN platform that Mr. Kutui and all the thought leaders sitting there may consider, I would like to make a proposal that we do that, we make a recommendation, see if we can have acceptance, and we can then help those populations that Mr. Dinesh just mentioned, who do not have those platforms, who do not have the visibility, but may still want to have more digitally literate populations who are skilled to handle the technology revolution as it comes our way. Thank you very much. Thank you to the Minister Raman Khan from Pakistan. Uh, Dr. Kitu, you would like to react, and Nick also, and Dinesh too, please. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I want to express my appreciation for the ministers for not only the passion they've shown, but the concrete steps they're trying to take for inclusion. 
Notice for us, the e-commerce week is to discuss how can we best bridge the gulf, the divide. What can we do? How can we contribute? And to hear concrete examples of this is very encouraging. I did not mention at the outset, we are very proud that we have a large delegation of Anctad youth, a network of youth from Anctad around the world who are playing a role here. I think one of the biggest challenges we face collectively is how to trigger the political appetite for action in the countries that are being left behind. And for us at Anctad, going through the youth is one route we are going. Together with uh, Jack Ma, we launched the eFounders program where we recruit young net entrepreneurs who go to the Hangzhou campus of Alibaba for training on what are the possibilities on electronic trading platforms. I was very, very glad. We just finished, graduated a class of 37 young entrepreneurs from Asia, and I'm very happy to see in our audience here, uh, Mr. Brian Wong, who is the Vice President of Alibaba in charge of global initiatives. Thank you very much and welcome. And he is our focal point for the youth empowerment through training at the uh, Hangzhou campus. And we'd like to encourage similar efforts. Let us build the army of forces which will push governments to take a commitment and to address the issues that are being addressed by those who are making progress. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, Nick. Um, yeah, just sort of picking up on something the last minister mentioned about uh, the need to sort of have regulations and stuff in place to take advantage of these rapidly changing technologies, which I, I fully agree with. Um, I think there are a few things that can be done, and I think one thing, and maybe this is a bit radical, but actually the GDPR rules, I think, are a fantastic step forward for basic digital rights. So European Union's uh, general data protection regulations, which are a very significant step about data privacy and data ownership and the rights of individuals uh, against massive corporations. Now, I think this can be picked up actually by a number of other countries. Already, Facebook has said that they want to implement GDPR rules around the world. And if you can actually have these sort of sta standard set of rules across the world, I think there's a lot of room there to, uh, to be improving on regulation before you come across these privacy issues, before you come across these issues of Facebook using your data and manipulating it. So I think GDPR is a really good model to sort of learn from. The other thing I would say is learn from the mistakes of the Western world and update your competition policies. So competition policies as it stands right now are built for largely the 19th century, not even the 20th century. We now have competition and monopolies that are based upon data and network effects. Competition policy as it exists today doesn't know how to deal with it. So I would say deal, update your competition policy. So if you have a local platform that you've developed and say Diddy or Uber comes along, decides they want to buy your local platform, you have rules in place to prevent these sorts of monopolies from occurring. If you want to support local industries, you have to have rules that ensure these global competitors aren't just going to come in and buy them, which is what's happening right now. So I think there are some basic regulations that can be done to support um, local industries. Thank you, Nick. I turn to Omobola that can share and, and compare uh, the experience uh, she had uh, in Nigeria. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say, I, I've sat in the, the seat of a number of the ministers, in, in, well, in their seats, and I know how difficult the work that they do is. Uh, there are two traps that you fall into when you are a, a policymaker. And the first trap is, you know, uh, when you talk about you create an, an enabling environment and you then allow the private sector to come in and, and, and do their stuff. The fact of the matter is that, and then the other, the other trap is, is the other, other end of the spectrum where you then actually do it yourself. And the, what happens is that you really don't get the impact in either one of those. And I think one of the messages that I would like to pass across uh, is the need to continuously engage with the with industry, particularly when it comes to building these um, these digital platforms. Because yes, they'll be built by the private sector, but when you have a sense of the benefits that you want from these platforms, it is important that you continue to engage with the industry and reiterate those benefits so that you get what you want at the end of the day. So 
this notion of an enabling environment and the private sector will come in and do what is right, I think it, it's, we just need to be very careful about that and we see the kind of mistakes or the challenges that the developed markets have had when they've left the, um, the, the market to the market, so, so to speak. Uh, the other point I wanted to make was on, uh, on, 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 on Alibaba and the work that they're doing with, the, with young people. I think that is tremendous. It's, it's really very good. I think the whole notion of, of um, supporting and enabling entrepreneurship in young people, particularly in the world of tech where they're already engaged, I think it's absolutely fantastic. But what I would like to say is that as we do that, as we push these 37 or however many young entrepreneurs into the, into the real world, they need, they're, they're going to need support because number one, they've never run a business before. So they really don't understand, you know, beyond being in this little incubator safe space, they don't understand how to run a business and the challenges that will come as they begin to uh, build their businesses. So there are two things that they need. They will need capital. I keep, I know I, I'm sounding like a broken record, but this is so important because there's not enough capital in, in, many of the, uh, uh, in many of our developing continents in, well, take China out. In, in Africa, there's not enough capital to support these entrepreneurs. They will need capital, number one. They will also need some levels of entrepreneurship and mentorship as they start their businesses. Because, like I said, understanding policy, understanding regulation, understanding competition, uh, understanding you know, what does profitability really mean, what's your customer acquisition cost, all those things that you, you really don't get until you start running a business. They need those things because the pace of the, of the growth of these companies is tremendous. These are companies that can grow you know, 10, 15, 20% every month, not every year. So they grow so fast, the entrepreneurs really are, you know, they're, they're lost, they're, their heads are swimming because things are happening so fast. And they need that grounding of business support as they, as they, as they develop their businesses and their great ideas. So best of luck to all the, the, all the graduates of the, of the economy and um, congratulations to Alibaba. Thank you. Before I turn to the Minister uh, of Senegal, that is uh, asking the floor. Danish, you wanted to react quickly? Based upon the speeches of all the ministers so far, one of the things that I realize is the over enthusiasm towards consumer protection. Now, let me reiterate that first the trade should happen, you know, when we laid out uh, roads, we did not, uh, from the day one, worry about accidents. You know, similarly, I would say consumer protection is far more later stage item. Second, I think as Secretary General said, that there is very little amount of B2C that is happening and 90% of the trade which is happening is B2B trade. Now, in most cases I have seen, the B2C is taking a lot more uh, bandwidth of the policy makers and the understanding of the policy makers. We should, with every country and every minister, every government, my suggestion is that we should focus on B2B adoption first and within country B2C adoption first. The cross-border thing, uh, whether the cross-border B2C from this country to outward or the inward, that has to be the last of the matter. The first, of, first two of the matter is a B2B and a B2C within country. I think those are the most important uh, areas that I would like every minister, every government to focus upon. It is only when you have developed a very good, uh, very good penetration of internet. So for example, now the smartphones have already become quite cheap. Uh, I think the only thing that is left to the every government is to increase the internet penetration and decrease the uh, data charges. You know, if every government can do the, so, like in Pakistan, we have been able to achieve from 13% to 33% in these two years. Uh, similarly, if we can achieve 80% data penetration and at a lower effective uh, cost rate, a lot of it would be already undertaken. Uh, E-commerce is, digital platforms are not only about e-commerce. Digital platforms are about access to information, access to education, access to entertainment, access to communication, information. So this communication, information, education, entertainment, you know, all of this is most of the time advertisement supported. And most of these do not even require a regulation to begin with. Only beyond a certain point uh, when, uh, when you reach a level of Facebook, that's when you uh, probably look at the data security and data 
uh, monopolization. I would say that our first focus for every developing nation and least developed nation should be to increase the internet adoption and then look at the e-commerce. Also, first look at the only domestic B2B and domestic B2C e-commerce, then only look at the uh, cross-border e-commerce. So these are the two suggestions that first look at the infrastructure and second look at the domestic uh, economy first beyond looking at, uh, before looking at the uh, international one. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Uh, Madame uh, la Ministre du Sénégal. I'd like to give the floor to the Minister of Senegal if you'd like to share your experience with the panelists. Merci beaucoup, Madame la Présidente. Thank you very much, Madam Moderator. I would like to greet the panelists and also all the participants as I share with you the vision of Senegal about the reform of the digital sector. sector. In order to ensure that um, the digital means are available to everyone by 2025, and to ensure that we're surrounded by a performant ecosystem, and this involves all stakeholders. And today, the government of my country has set the mission aimed at improving infrastructure throughout the country. And in order to ensure that we have um, equal access to infrastructure throughout the country and ensure in internet coverage of 63% uh, and reaching a coverage of 120% for cell phones. And we are focusing on different platforms at different levels and on the basis of different initiatives the government is working on remote services, modernizing the administration, and trying to simplify numerous procedures in the health sector and the educational sector in the area of tourism in order to be able to ensure that we save time and ensure greater transparency at the level of administration, but also in parallel focusing on public-private partnerships, focusing on cross-border trade, and we are involving the leaders uh, in this area. Now, when we look at the private sector, we are looking at uh, developing platforms that bring together all uh, stakeholders in the areas dealing with money and money transfer transfers, ensuring the greater operability of uh, different uh, stakeholders. In 2016, the figure covering the sector was about 1.3 million euro. And uh, this contributes to the GDP at the level about 8%. And this is indeed quite significant progress. However, we are also facing the problem of the speed in which uh, things are changing. And we shouldn't overlook also the need to ensure social equality. Because when we talk about uh, developing the digital area, we have to see what impact it has on uh, different social groups in the country, on people living in urban areas, living in rural areas, trying to do, reduce the different divides or different gaps that exist in order to ensure the adaptation and consolidation of the legal framework. It has to evolve at the same speed as the different uh, challenges evolve. And when we talk about small um, enterprises, they really do not have the necessary scale in order to be involved in um, certain activities when they can use their own capital as a hedge. 
so we have to help them in this work so different steps are being taken that should bring us up to the level of international standards and we have been thinking at least i have been thinking if we take into account the gap that exists between our countries and developed countries then the only way to overcome this uh, divide is on the basis of information and communication technologies to add value to what we're doing. So these indeed are the challenges that we have identified. And uh, we believe that with the help of e-commerce, the entire value chain should be modified as we improve the infrastructure and then this will lead to a better distribution of the results of production and here we still face uh, some difficulties thank you thank you very much Ms. by sharing with us the experience of senegal uh, to the representative of zimbabwe uh, from the ministry of uh, industry mrs uh, shonhiwa the floor is yours Thank you, um, and thank you for giving me the floor. I just want to agree um, with the point that um, the pace of development, it's, um, uh, it's, it's beyond expectations, it's uh, going very fast. And for us, you know, in the developing countries, it becomes a major, uh, a major challenge. Uh, we are fearful that we are going to be left behind and of course, there are consequences to that. Um, we, we have challenges uh, on resources. I think a question was asked by Dr. Johnson on um, how we are going to get more capital to, ve to develop uh, digital platforms. The costs are high. We, we need those you know, with money, we need investments. Uh, those with money to come in and um, you know uh, invest to to have that capital, and um, the request is that you know we need to be inclusive. Um, the international community needs to carry with it the developing countries along, um, so that there is uh, that dialogue, there is uh, cooperation, uh, they they support going forward. And we believe that you know, um, sessions or dialogues such as this are critical. And uh, we believe that while as we, a few of us have afforded to come to Geneva, um, if we could have these um, uh, take place you know, in the regions, sort of decentralized in the regions, so that there is more of us that will attend, more stakeholders, that will attend and experience, you know, what we are experiencing here in this forum, we we'll, we'll most um, uh, welcome that. Um, I, I've, I've indicated that uh, there is the question of how do we get uh, capital. Of course, then, you know, we, we need, we need um, um, investment. There is the capital for the platforms, and there is also the issue of skills. I think that was raised. Um, the, we need to talk around that. There is need for a con conversation uh, around that. Then Nick, um, I think in his first intervention, he raised the issue of um, um, what he referred to as um, power dependency. And on that, uh, one uh, would want to say that we desperately need more conversation. It has been raised here, but this is to do with uh, consumers. We need more, more, more conversation about, you know, where does the consumer uh, stand? Things are moving fast, and uh, we are talking of big, um, big uh, companies here, uh, powerful companies. I'm imagining that small um, um, uh, consumer, that rural woman, you know, somewhere there in the rural area, who is supposed to be also uh, participating on these digital platforms. Uh, where does that person stand? So we need a serious conversation uh, yesterday to address issues um, to, to do with uh, the interests of uh, uh, the, the consumer. And just to say uh, briefly that uh, in Zimbabwe, the, the government of Zimbabwe is focusing on trying to provide the right environment for uh, business to thrive. 
and um, we are moving in our, in our own way. And um, of course, always uh, we, are, we are playing catch up. Uh, we have, um, as the government of Zimbabwe, automated quite a number of processes. We are it's a continuing process. Um, we are hoping to, to scale it up so that we remove the, the bottlenecks you know, uh, to, you know, in, in doing business. Um, and also, uh, perhaps just to inform that you know, in an of, er, effort to attract fresh capital in the development of ICTs, but also perhaps you know, we, you know, a, a reform that, we, that um, is as recent as the past two weeks, um, the government, which used to own um, um, uh, three um, ICT companies, um, is disinvesting and is inviting private sector to come in as um, uh, strategic partners um, in the it's three telecom companies and we're looking for strategic partners who can come in and put in the necessary capital that will also steer us to try and keep up uh, with others. And just to say we thank uh, UNCTAD for this opportunity, inviting us so that we share. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Mrs. Shohinwa, Shohinwa from Zimbabwe. Um, you just spoke about consumers, so I'll turn to uh, Mrs. Uh, Amanda Long, who is Director General of uh, Consumers International. Uh, if you could uh, share with us um, what your organization is about. Okay, thank you. Uh, my organization represents 200 member organizations from 100 countries, and those members are consumer organizations. And I would actually say that consumer protection early in this process is absolutely essential if we're going to uh, address unintended consequences. And um, I've been really interested, actually, in some of what the panel has had to say um, in this discussion, where they've touched on unintended consequences. The Facebook and Cambridge Analytica debacle uh, that we've all witnessed uh, around the globe uh, in the last couple of weeks is a really good example, unfortunately, a really good unfortunate example of, of this. Um, uh, but different panelists have talked about unintended consequences of platforms, whether that be addiction, concentration, distribution of benefits, different panelists have mentioned these things. Um, if, we're, if we can address consumer protection issues up front, um, then actually what we can do is, is, uh, is prevent some of those issues. Um, my community uh, also needs to, needs to think differently about how, how we do some of this so that we can be more effective. And at Consumers International, um, we, we've looked at it and said, well, we, we need to change some of how we work um, so that we can be more effective at getting the consumer voice into the development of digital, uh, of digital economy and society as early as possible. So we, we have now got a new strategy which is quite unusual for our community, but which is about how we can engage business and innovators earlier in the process so that we can get better solutions. What I'd be really interested in uh, would be hearing a bit more from the panelists um, as to how they think uh, dealing with these unintended consequences um, could, be, could be done so that we don't find ourselves in the situation that, that we find ourselves with uh, these large platforms um, and, the, and the problems that, that we see emerging. So what could change? My community is changing some of our ways of behaving. I think others will need to too, and I'd love to hear about that. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Long. Um, maybe I'll, um, I'll take uh, with Leo Stigler from Rangier Africa. Um, could you tell us what uh, your company is doing uh, in Africa, investing, funding some programs? Thank you, Ms. President. Um, with uh, Ringy Africa, we run uh, marketplace and media companies across eight sub-Saharan African countries with our 700 employees in Sub-Saharan Africa. I would like to add to what Dr. Johnson said about funding um, in developing countries and specifically uh, in, in Africa. And that is the fact that there is a large lack of funding um, to truly build local platforms and truly local large internet companies in many of the developing countries. Um, so one example is in Africa, total funding into the technology startup ecosystem last year was around $200 million. That's about 2% of the last funding round of only Uber. 
So that's one, country, uh, one company against the complete ecosystem in Africa in terms of funding. Um, and that's only 2% of that one company. Um, so, and at the same time, obviously, the challenges, but also the, the chance to use digital tools in developing countries is that much higher, but the funding is that much lower. So, so what I would really like to encourage is an even closer collaboration between uh, international organizations, uh, UNCTAD, the private sector, as well as uh, countries to close that funding gap. And I would be really interested how the honorary panelists see the situation and what they think should be done about it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I've seen reactions for the two, uh, the two remarks, uh, Mrs. Long and you, Mrs. Stigler, but now I will give the floor um, to um, Ms. Dr. Jian Hu Li, uh, Chief Development Officer of Didi Chu Sheng, uh, which is the equivalent of uh, Uber. The Ch is it the Chinese Uber? Uh, we are but you, more you than can, Uber. You, you can, uh, you, if you want to speak in, okay. in, in Chinese, you can, and, and it will be translated too. Sorry. But in English, perfect. Okay. This is uh, actually is more than Uber. We have uh, all kind of uh, transportation service, the product, different products. For example, we have taxi. So we started from uh, working with taxi in 2012. Actually, the founder of Didi, when he started this company, he actually didn't know there is a Uber company in the world. Okay. So, yeah, I, I, I would like to give a brief introduction of Didi. Yeah, we are very young company, less than six years old, but we have served uh, 450 million people in China, only in China. Yeah, but uh, now we are expanding our business internationally. So uh, every day we completed uh, 25, 10, 25 million, million riders. It's about 40 million people traveling on DD platform on a daily basis. So that we, about 10% of Chinese vehicles are connected to DD platform. It's big, very huge platform. So we are very proud we can serve so many people in China, there is a, but still we have a big room for growth because the population in China is so big, so huge. So uh, I have some, actually I have some suggestions to Dr. Kitui. Yeah, I think it's uh, very important for the international community to, to discuss the significance and the benefit the digital platform can bring to people. Yeah, the, the story of Didi in China illustrates the importance of digital, digital platform. Even you don't agree with that, that, that digital platform I think is the direction. Many in the, in, the, in, in the near future, I think many industries will have their own domain, the dominating platforms. Even you don't like it. That, that's the direction, that's the tendency. We, it doesn't make, it doesn't work if, if you don't like it, it's, it's welcome. Okay, so uh, I, I have suggestions to, for uh, Dr. Kitui, yeah, because we, are, we, are, we want to yeah, the, the, the expanding, uh, we want to expand our business, we want to bring more, the, the benefits for more people, for, for more countries, uh, because Chinese people, they enjoy the service of Didi. People like it, and also we provide 21 million job opportunities for, for Chinese people. Among them, there are so many people living in poverty, and over, over more than one million people coming from zero income family. And there are also 2.3 million women working on the DD platform. So we are very proud about that. Uh, the suggestion is how can the international community do something, concrete things, to help private sector to expand their service to, to, the, to globally. So for example, what is sharing economy? How do you define sharing economy? I, I don't think there is a very clear or unified definition about sharing economy. But what, what, or for example, we, when, we expand, when we expand our business to other countries, there, we always fa face the challenge of regulation, the challenge of payment, the challenge of GPS. 
because there is no unified. For I, I can hear I, in China, I use WeChat. We, you, we I use Alipay, but here I have to bring my credit card. Sometimes you have to pay cash. That's so different world. So the international community, I think, should discuss the issues and find the solution. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Thank you so much. So I turn to Mr. Sise Khan, who is the president of um, the African Civil Society on the Informa Information Society, ACSIS. Mr. Khan. Thank you, Madam Chair. If you allow me, I will speak in French. Je vous en prie. Please go ahead. Um, je voulais remercier. I wish to sincerely thank UNCTAD for allowing us to speak as a civil society. My organization is present in over 45 countries in Africa and in the diaspora, and there are over 500 NGOs. We work on the ground in the field with technology-related issues. This is a platform that claims its pan-African image and the defense of the, the rights of Africa. This is important because 25 years ago, we said that we'd reach the moon, if you will, with uh, ICT. Now, what we're seeing today in Africa is that uh, we're far from this. The internet connection level is quite low. There are countries that stand at 3 to 4% in terms of connection rates. Now, all of the issues related to gadgets, uh, ICT gadgets, for young persons, for women. This morning, we talked about the gender gap. And we really get the feeling that we uh, aren't seeing things really successfully. We're not availing of uh, what we should benefiting of what we should be from digitalization. E-commerce, we believe, is the greatest opportunity at the present time because it will generate jobs, it will generate value added, and it will enable us to support uh, ourselves and base ourselves already on um, the fabric that we have by using digital tools. However, the problem, uh, we get the feeling, is that most African countries are not yet aware of the issues at stake when it comes to the digital economy. And they don't look at these issues in the right light. Now, I have another concern to raise, and that is that the money generated by ICTs means that ICTs are the greatest source of mobilization when it comes to financial resources in Africa. We note that ICTs are in the hands of multinationals, so the, the money isn't uh, trickling down to Africa. E-commerce, as I see it, isn't reaching out to Africa. Our platform will make it possible, and this is a concern I have, and uh, I want to be reassured, but I see that we are uh, aspiring further in terms of our economies. We have initiatives so, such as Rawi in Senegal. It's a local initiative. This needs to be hailed, and it develops things at the local level. We also have another initiative in Kenya. But generally speaking, if you look at uh, us in the world, we have the 35th economy across the world. Uh, GAFA, for example, or uh, other companies that basically control all of the information circulating throughout the world. And at the helm of these companies are private partners. This sends uh, tingles down our spine because Africa really isn't prepared at all. We believe that Africa has no strong political leadership in order to grapple GAFAs. Uh, Facebook, let's take this example, it's a company which uh, sold data some days ago. Africa is really along the same lines, but there's no connection, there's no link. So what is the problem here? We would like these digital platforms, when they come into existence, there's, we stand at 1%, 99% potential, therefore. When they come into existence, uh, not necessarily I'm talking about Uber or Facebook here, but when it changes people's lives with respect to things at the local level, if we take into account the daily aspects of citizens, that's where we interact as civil society. And given 
Africa's, Africa's vulnerability, we have called upon uh, the assistance from the first Pan-African summit. We have issues such as cybersecurity and data localization, uh, languages also. All of these issues are related and we need to benefit further from digital resources because things aren't happening as they should. But perhaps our eminent uh, panelists on the podium can perhaps reassure me because I have a great deal of concern as to what these platforms will actually contribute. Thank you very much, Mr. Sisikan. Uh, questions and remarks that have been addressed uh, to you, Dr. Kituyi. Would, would you like to already answer or react? Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, before I react, I want on behalf of ANCTA to express uh, my, my regrets. There was a mix-up, uh, Honorable Minister from Senegal. You were supposed to have a seat uh, at the front, so unfortunately you were put in the place of Senegal, not in the place of ministers. I hope uh, you will forgive us, uh, Madame Baye, uh, Je suis désolé. Um, now, to the specific questions that have been raised, I, I, I like very much that we are discussing about how things can be done. Now, I'll start with the last issue. My friend, Ked uh, from Access, I think part of the problem of civil society in Africa is to have overdeveloped the antenna of what can go wrong, but insufficiently developed the antenna of what can, be go, can go right. You will not incentivize people to come in when you have overdeveloped the risk factors without the positive factors. I, I, we have to draw that balance because it's not our narrative. Our narrative has to balance. There are opportunities, but it is, uh, sometimes it has components that can be negative and we have to see how we can limit their consequences. Secondly, I think it's important governments have to drive converting the challenge into opportunity. We can only assist in defining what is the best way others have attracted interest into the market. We can have dialogue about creating a universal enabling environment for interoperability of a mobile, uh, mobile payment system, for example. Uh, Dr. James Lee did mention this. Uh, why do we have a multiplicity of mobile wallets? Uh, PayPal has tried, but in regions we're looking for interoperability of uh, regional uh, mobile wallets in a way that makes it easier to have cross-border payment solutions and therefore cross-border uh, business, whether it's B2B or B2C. Uh, and I think the trust economy is going to need all the players. Consumer protection, a guarantee of right of return goods. I know there are some major players who say they play by the rules, but when you import from them, they make their own exporters commit not to bring back what is already exported. I think we have to flush this out, that the right of return goods is part of building the confidence in a trust-driven economy. Um, I liked very much the issue of consumer protection. We, as UNCTAD, are the UN agency charged the responsibility of growing and nurturing consumer rights. And one of the things we're doing right now is that the new generation of legislation on consumer protection must take a stock of challenges in the digital economy that are new challenges that we have to respond to. But a fundamental issue that we also should agree, our recent track history of the digital economy is that innovators are miles ahead of regulators. And what it does is that when it is late to discover the vulnerabilities and the exposures and manipulations, regulators become too uh, cautious and want to block what, yes, that they, what they do not understand they think will be bad. We have to regain goodwill by greater voluntary engagement between innovators and regulators in order to forestall, to, 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 to reverse the laws of trust that has come with some of the abuse that has been uh, reported so widely in the recent past. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. So I will ask the reaction of Nick, Dr. Johnson and Danish, and also if you could make a sentence to wrap up because we're running out of time. We have to finish in a couple 
minutes, in four minutes, it has to be over because we have to leave this room. So Nick, could you please react to the different uh, remarks that have been made about uh, the regulation and the dangers? Uh, so I'll speak a little bit to investment. And I think this, this stat that $200 million spent in African investment on tech stuff last year, uh, it's absolutely shocking. And I think the real issue here is, again, how do you compete against global companies? Uh, Uber is, again, a fantastic example. Uber lost $1 billion trying to fight off their competitor in China, uh, and Diddy ended up winning that one. So congrats to Diddy for that. <laughs> uh, but how do you compete with a company that could waste a billion dollars and lose a billion dollars? You can't. You can't. So I think what needs to be talked about here is not just levels of investment, but also protection for local industries. So I think you can look at China as a fantastic example of this. Why is Google and Facebook and Amazon not dominant in China? It's because they protected the local market from these Western companies. There's a smaller scale example, though, which is really fascinating. Austin, Texas, a small city in America. They banned Uber from being able to run in this city. And what happened was people with very little money and about six months of time created an Uber clone. It was a local startup, it was wildly successful, it paid workers a decent wage, it invested money back into the local community. This was an Uber clone that was made by, with a pittance of money. Uh, so this is, I think, a really important aspect, not just levels of investment, which I agree upon, but protection as well. Uh, I'll mention one really interesting idea, which I think needs more work, but people are thinking about this, which is a national data fund. So data is absolutely crucial to artificial intelligence right now. It is valuable material, and companies want, it, want access to it. Now, most governments have a lot of access to public data, and the risk is that you're just going to give this away to companies and not get any benefit from it. Instead, what you could do is you could build up a national data fund and rent out access to this data, this public data, under heavy supervision, so there's not any privacy implications or anything like that. But this is a way of bringing in revenue from stuff that you already have. Uh, so I will say, final concluding point, I think the real choice right now is getting some short-term benefits from digital platforms or risking long-term dependency on these global monopolies. I think that is the real risk, is that five to 10 years down the line, you find yourself dependent on Google and Facebook and Amazon and Tencent and Alibaba, and you wonder what happened. I think that's the risk to worry about. Thank you, Nick. Omobola, please. Thank you. Um, I think, first of all, you can't overemphasize the importance of connectivity. So um, as we work towards you know, getting everybody online for that inclusiveness of these digital platforms, I think that's really very, very important that you can't, that's the kind of ground zero of everything that we're talking about. I think the other thing to also notice is as we work to get people on the internet, we, we're missing another, another opportunity. And that's the opportunity that we have higher penetration of mobile than we have of internet. And when you look at some of the most innovative platforms we're seeing, the platform itself is internet connected but the access to the platform is actually via mobile. And so there's, a, there's, a, there's an opportunity there that we, we are missing because we're so focused on this connectivity. And, and some of the, I'll, I'll give some examples uh, uh, later on. I know we don't have enough, enough time. But the last point I wanted to make was around um, capital and, and the fact that, you know, how do we close that funding gap? Apart from commercial returns, you know, capital goes to uh, um, um, areas or sectors where the narrative is strong and the market sentiment is high. I think that, you know, UNCTAD and many of the other organizations that are working on these kind of initiatives, we have enough information to build a narrative around investments in tech in developing economies that can help to raise the market sentiment and can also help to um, spin a more positive narrative around the need to invest. And I think that's one of the things that I would like to take out of these kind of, um, these kind of um, uh, events, where we just continue to build that very strong narrative. We all believe in what we're doing, believe in the benefits of digital platforms. We need to get that message out there to the people that have the capital so that they now bring that capital in based on the narrative, based on the market sentiments, and based on what we see in our quite um, good commercial returns in some of these companies. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, Danish, uh, before I give the floor back to the Secretary General of ANCTAD, what is your final remark? As I said earlier, there are large nations like India, China, Indonesia, Brazil, uh, and Russia. They can solve the problem very differently. With the access to capital, they can create local Didi, they can create local WeChat, they can create uh, uh, local platforms. However, these local platforms 
you know, created in India, created in China, and created in Brazil and Russia and America. They need to inter be interoperable. How messaging platform like WhatsApp and WeChat can be inter interoperable. How payments platform like PayPal and Paytm and uh, Alipay can be interoperable. So that is one problem to solve. The more difficult problem is for the smaller uh, countries, whether developed or underdeveloped. The, for them, the opportunity lies in the local, hyper-local items. So for example, Uber is not a global company. Uber is a local, local company. It's, a, it's made of some 2,000 cities. You know, every city runs a very separate, separate Uber. You know, you don't need a, a global uh, Facebook kind of a global thing. So, in places like where where there is a Craigslist or where there is a OLX, which is which is more localized, local platforms can uh, can do wonders as uh, it could be done in Austin, Texas. Similarly, but for the purpose of larger items such as platform, uh, payment platforms, messaging platforms, I think it will be unwise for smaller countries to even try that. They should align with one of the larger countries so that or, or nearby larger countries in the similar language where they can have uh, similar messaging and payment platform. Because messaging and payment platform, if every country is going to have its own, it, it is not in the interest of anybody. Now, third and foremost is when we are looking at the data monopolization and, uh, and consumer protection, I think these fears are overrated and we should first taste the benefits of the digital platforms because benefits of digital platforms are far higher than the uh, certain pitfalls like uh, data protection and monopolization. Uh, things they protect. I believe that we should first give the benefit of education, entertainment, information, trade, uh, you know, access to market, access to product, access to technology, access to finance, before we can worry about, uh, you know, long before we can worry about consumer protection and data privacy. So I would say that for all the, plat uh, all the comp mm, smaller countries, it is important that they continue to focus on internet connectivity and they continue to focus on availability of their banking system into some kind of a digital uh, payment platform. So either uh, align, so for example, very recently, uh, India align, uh, opened up its digital banking platform called UPI to WhatsApp. Now you can transfer money from one bank one Indian bank to another Indian bank uh, using WhatsApp. So WhatsApp and WhatsApp is not owning the wallet. It is the bank to bank transfer which is being opened up by WhatsApp. And it is being done by WhatsApp, it is done by Google Tage, it is the being done by Paytm. So it is no longer the wallet economy. It is the, it, it is the bank to bank uh, uh, switch that has been created and which is helping us uh, do all, achieve all that. With that, I would say thank you very much for calling us here, and thank you. Uh. Thank you, Danish. So uh, we, we spoke a lot before um, ending. I mean, we spoke a lot about youth. Dr. Kitu, you spoke about that wonderful program that you have with uh, UNCTAD Ambassador uh, Jack Ma. Um, so we have a representative of UNCTAD Youth uh, that is sitting there that followed all the, the exchanges and that has certainly something to exchange and to deliver before we go to the conclusion. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be here representing Juntat Youth Network. My name is Eugenia Novoa. And I will present this statement in, in the name of all the youths which encompass Juntat Youth Network. Digital platforms have provided so many opportunities for youth people to engage in online e-commerce and more many youth other uses. Youth globally are the largest consumers of what the internet has to offer. And we play a great role in shaping the landscape of digital platforms. Junta has 
had the opportunity to meet bright youth minds to have used power of digital platforms to their advantage through the EAT Founders Initiative, jointly driven by Juntad and Jagma, Special Advisor of the Juntad for Young Entrepreneurs and head of Alibaba Group. However, they expressed that not all equally enjoy the benefits of digital platforms. For example, many young people in developing countries do not easily have access to a stable internet connections, online payments, and more. In the youth recommendations for last year, e-commerce week, we, the youth, prioritize updating methods of digital skills building and education and strengthening e-commerce regulation to allow safer and easier cross-border payments in developing countries and support from private sector and governing bodies to encourage sustainable e-commerce through employment. Youth welcome the efforts in making digital platforms more safe, secure, as well as ensuring young people around the world can make the most of what these digital platforms can provide for themselves and for their communities. Thank you all for your continued engagement with youth and for giving us the time here to share our, our views with you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, Dr. Kitui, for the final remark. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm glad that we saved the best for last. Uh, you are the owners of Agenda 2030, and we're very, very happy to be custodians who give you a chance to say your own challenges and your vision. I want to use this opportunity to thank everybody who has participated here for your patience, for your engagement. It has been a very, very, very useful and rewarding experience. I want to thank everybody who has joined us. The interesting discussions that have been going on, uh, whether it's a sharing economy or the possibilities of uh, the payment systems, these are interesting things for us. For us as an organization, our next phase is how do we take this conversation closer to the ground in developing countries? And I'm glad that uh, one of the first steps in this is our commitment that um, before the end of the year, we'd like to have the first e-commerce week hosted in Africa, and which we hope that we'll be able to get to move to other different parts of the continent. And this is exciting to us, and I hope that many of the participants here from around the world, you'll come with this message, talk directly to African leaders, those who are most left behind, to see how much they belong to the past, and how much they need to move along. And we hope that others can also help in the community of discussing how do we raise the resources necessary beyond the political goodwill to translate this opportunity into an instrument of inclusion. Sustainable Development Goal number 18 as an enabler for the rest of the SDG. Thank you very much, Madam Moderator. Thank you, Dr. Thank you Kitty. very much, uh, members of the panel. And thank you very much, everybody.